Right, good morning everyone and uh, good morning to our students online as well. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer and then we'll get into almost the last portion of our course. So would anyone like to pray? Go ahead. Let's pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for enabling each one of us to gather here. We thank you, O Lord, for your powerful covenant for your finished work at the cross, for the blood, O Lord. We pray that as we continue to learn, we pray that you will equip us and strengthen us in areas which we are unaware and in areas that we are aware, but when we have a little confusion, that you clarify and you will strengthen us in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Right. Thank you so much. All right, so last class, uh, all of you were... In Mangalore, especially our in-person students were in Mangalore, and uh, trust you had a good time of ministry there as well. Uh, but we did have our class, so I hope that you were able to, uh, you know, just go back and listen to the class. Uh, but let us just do a quick review of what we did uh, last class. Last class we talked about uh, mainly from chapter 18, the wisdom of the cross. Um, we talked about substitution. Right, and what substitution means, where God took our place. God died for man. When we was where we were supposed to die, God took our place. And we took we looked also at uh, one man's sin, which is the first Adam and the first man, when the first Adam being Adam who fell into sin, and because of that, sin came into this world, right? Sin and death was not part of God's plan. But because of what Adam did, it became a natural. Sin entered this world. Death entered this world. Because of sin, there is death. God did not design sin. God did not design death. Right? But what did the last Adam do? That is Jesus. He came as a man. And wherever Adam, as man, wherever we fail, wherever we sin, the last Adam overcame. He was victorious. And on the cross, although it appeared like a man was dying, but it was God who became flesh dying for us. That is substitution. right? Then we talked about atonement. Atonement is a price that was paid in full. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, we saw that there's a day of atonement. It means that Jesus met all the demands to die on the cross. Every sin, every sickness, every disease, every, you know, everything that the enemy brought into this world was put on Jesus. He paid the full price. And so in the Old Covenant, we see that in the Day of Atonement, they would take the blood and pour it on the tabernacle. And then all, they would also you know, take a goat, the scapegoat, and all the sins of Israel were put on that scapegoat and the goat was sent away. That is atonement, paid in full. Right? It's like Jesus is putting his signature. Right? So it's like taking a paper and we are writing one to hundred. All the sins that we have made. Right? And Jesus is coming and he's saying, putting his signature and saying paid in full. We don't have to pay the price for it, right? And we looked at some, we looked at redemption, which is one of the most powerful aspects of the cross. Christ redeemed us. The word redemption means to buy back with a price. There's a price that is paid, right? You buy it back. So, so you know, sometimes when we talk about ministry, say, hey, I want to join ministry. There's a price to be paid. It's not, it's not okay because I don't know what to do. I want to join ministry. No. There's a price. I was just teaching in the um, third years. He's talking about how Paul and Timothy. And Paul is sharing with Timothy and saying, Timothy, you join with my sufferings. He didn't say, Timothy, it's a good fun. You know, you get into the ship. You go to one place and then we, you know, preach the gospel. Everyone will say, thank you, pastor. Welcome, pastor. And then they'll give you good food to eat and you, you have a good night's rest. He didn't say that. 
Paul said, you join in my sufferings, Timothy. That means what? Sometimes people will stone you. People will try to beat you up. People will try to put you into prison. They will chain you. They will ridicule you. They will spit at you. They will mock you for what you are preaching. But join in that sufferings because it is fruitful. Right? Because you will see the work of God in your life. Right? So Jesus, he redeemed us. He purchased us with a price. What was the price? Come on. What is the price Jesus paid? Huh? What? His life? Yes. Why are you confused? <laughs> Jesus paid by his own blood, his own price, his own life he gave for us. Right? He redeemed us back. And I talked about this, right? It was not like Jesus came, okay, you are the Messiah. Okay, you'll be in prison. Tomorrow we'll decide what to do. Morning they got up, okay, just crucify him. They took him. Somebody carried the cross for him. He went up. No. The scourging, the beating, 40 minus 1, the lashing, the crown of thorns, all of it was the full redemption price that he had to pay. It was not a simple price. Psalmist says, I look down and I can see my bones. So it was, not a, it was not a price that was like, you know, okay, just finish it off. One 20 minutes work, this is. No. There was, there was nothing left. You know, what is blood? Because of the blood in our body, we live. Yes or no? Right? Have you tried cutting off your fingers? If you don't, if you haven't, please don't. Right? Don't cut off your fingers. But if you cut your finger, and if it's a deep cut, it will keep bleeding. Until you look after it. Right? Now when Jesus was beaten, the blood was dripping out of his body at all times. So by the time he reached the cross, and he was hanging on the cross, there's no blood left. What happens when a body doesn't have blood? There's no uh, red blood cells, there's no white blood cells. What happens? It shrinks. It is the blood that causes this you know, if you hold, everyone hold your hand and do this. Right? That's your muscle, right? So that's because of the blood that's flowing in that you can hold your muscle. If there's no blood, you can only, it's only bone there. And there are nerves. So if there's no blood, this hand will become, what, what is normally this thick, will become this thin. You understand? Because all the blood is drained out. So when Jesus was on the cross, they, they pierced his side, water came out. That means over, no more blood left. It would have been 20 kgs. Just giving an example. Probably would have been around 20 to 25 kgs. Because all the blood is gone. Right? He would have been, sh you know, like, shrunk. Jesus, he purchased us. He redeemed us. By his own blood. Remember Isaiah 53? What did they say? They could not they, they saw him, they they could not recognize him that he was the Messiah. So the price was paid in full. God's wrath and anger was put on Jesus. He redeemed us with a price. And this price was one price that was done once for the entire world, for many people. Right? So let's go to chapter 19, the power and the blessings of the cross. Now we talked about the power, just a few more things. The power of the cross breaks the dominion of sin and Satan in your life. Okay, declare this after me. The power of the cross breaks the dominion of sin and Satan over my life. Sin is natural. Satan will do his work. But the power of the cross destroys that. It destroys it. Right? So if we are being tempted and we fall into sin, and we're living in sin, don't sit in your sin. Get up. Go back to the cross and say, I, I, I declare, I believe that the power of the cross can destroy this sin in my life. 
right? And it can destroy the works of the devil. Let me tell you something. When the devil sees you and he sees me, he doesn't see just people. He tries to bring fear, unbelief, you know, all of these other aspects into our life. But if we are walking, we, when the Holy Spirit inside of us, if we know that we are walking in anointing, when the devil sees us, he doesn't see us as second, first year Bible college student. That is for people around us to see, first years. When the devil sees us, he sees us as the anointed of God. He's afraid. Right? But if we open our lives and we say, okay, you know what, this is the biggest problem I've faced, then what will happen? He will say, thank you for opening the door. Now tell me where should I sit? And then we have fear, unbelief. We'll say, okay, you sit in this area. If we have uh, you know, depression, anxiety, okay, you sit in this area. But the truth is the power of the cross breaks the dominion. What is dominion? The hold of Satan. It's defeated. It's broken. Right now, the devil is defeated. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the devil is defeated? Yes. Right? You've got to believe it to walk in it. It's not because I'm saying. You've got to believe that the devil is defeated. Oh, but he's doing so much. Let him do. But he's defeated. Who is greater? Jesus or the devil? And whose child are you? Jesus' child or the devil's child? So who's the winner? So when the challenge comes, let me tell you, my brother was, I was sharing this. You know, my brother, my eldest brother, um, you know, he, it was I think 2007 or 8, you know, it's happened, where he overdosed. We rushed him to the hospital and the doctors, you know, just checked on him and all. We rushed him to the emergency and they said there's no heartbeat. He's mostly going. He's gone. I remember I wasn't a, much of a believer at that time, but I just knew a few things. I said, God, I don't accept this. Number one, I don't accept this. My brother will live. Right. Number two, your word says that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But you have come to give life and life in abundance. So, I don't accept what this doctor has said. The doctor's report is not the final report. Yes or no? He told me. The doctor told me. There's no heartbeat. He's gone. And I remember there was this fear inside me. Oh, my own brother. What will I tell my parents? What, what, what? All these thoughts. I remember saying, no. I'm going to stand on God's word. I'm not going to accept what the devil is doing. So I said, God, thank you for giving him life. I thank you that you're, you're the life giver. And you will give him life. I went, I went to park the car, the vehicle, because it was an emergency. I had to go and park it. I came back. He was drink, sitting and drinking juice. And I asked the doctor, what happened? He said, I don't know. He got up, he sat, he asked for juice. We gave him juice. What did you do? I didn't do anything. Let me tell you something. Don't let the devil dictate terms in your life. Don't let the devil dictate terms in your life. You dictate the terms to the devil. Why? Because the power of the cross breaks the dominion of sin and Satan in your life. Right? So it may not be things like this, but begin to start using the word of God as the greatest weapon in your life. How many of you are going through a challenge right now? Most of us, if you're not going through a challenge, that means something is, okay, good. <laughs> Praise God, you're not going through a challenge. Well, there's something always, right? 
What does the Bible say? In this, what did Jesus say? In this world, you will have tribulations, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, Jesus is telling who? Twelve fellows who are sitting there thinking they are going to become leaders. The twelve disciples are sitting, oh man, okay, we'll do this ministry. Now, Jesus is saying, hey, you will have trouble in this world after I go. They're going to crucify me, they're going to kill me. Now, they are saying, no, no, God, Jesus, why? It's nice, no, everything's going nice. No, 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 nothing's going nice. In this world, you will have tribulations. It is part of life. But what does Jesus say? Take heart. Be encouraged because I've overcome the world. Now, he's talking about this before the cross. And so we are after the cross. And so will we have troubles? Will we have tribulations? Many. But you take heart. Because God, Jesus, has overcome the world. It is very easy, telling you, it's very easy to love God and follow God when everything is going good in your life. Yes or no? At the moment we see a mountain, we crumble. That's not what God's called us for. You've got to hold on to the word of God. Remember, the doctor's report is not the last report. The doctor may say this is something that can never be changed. No, it can be changed. Who decides? Jeremiah, uh, I forget, I think Jeremiah 37, 14. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Nothing. Nothing that God cannot do. Yes? So remember, the power of the cross breaks the dominion of Satan over your life. In Adam, we were slaves. In Adam, we came under dominion of sin. But in the second Adam, which is Christ, we've been set free from sin. We're set free from, in the, in the second Adam, we see that we are set free from Satan's dominion and authority over your life. If Satan says, this is what you have to do, what did you do? Don't say, okay, as you say. Then you, we become a slave. To Satan and sin. You're not a slave. You you stand up, you rise up, you wear the you know Ephesians 6, you wear, you stand strong in the Lord, you wear the armor of God, you put on the helmet of salvation, and you fight the good warfare. This is a fight, it's a war. Yes or no? Right? There are different fights that we'll have to fight. Choose your fights, choose your wars. But don't choose to fight it alone. Fight it with by putting on the armor of God. You know, the enemy will say, okay, this fellow is he's not I've brought trouble upon him, still he's praising God. He'll take his fiery dart and he'll try to attack you in another way. Now imagine your shield, you have kept it in the side, just resting for some time. The shield of faith is always there. So when the fiery dart comes, you see it, you put the shield of faith. And the fiery dart is stopped. Then the devil will try something else. He'll try to come in another way. He'll use the shield. Then he'll try to come and say, try to attack you and say, you know, you have done all these things wrong. How can you do this? How can you look at this? This is the problem. This is what you did before. This is how you are. How can God forgive you? You put on the breastplate of righteousness. Say, hey. Devil, I have a right standing before God. You see this breastplate here? The righteousness of God. You will not understand it. Right? You, you hold on. You have to be able to know your identity and fight out of that identity. Right? Of course, there will be a time when you go into the room, you close the door, and you pray, nothing wrong. I've done that. I've shared it with you. When, my, when they said your father will very, you know, he may not live because he's on 50, 52, or 02. I declared God's word. I said, I don't agree to this, but I did go back to the room and I prayed and I cried out to God. But when I came out of that room, it was. 
it was like an assurance that God is with me. Right? So nothing wrong. It's not like if you cry and pray, uh, you you're, you know you lose faith. No. We're human beings. Did Jesus cry? He wept. So he was. He went through all of this. So it's okay. God understands. But when we cry and we say, "Oh, what is this? Why is this happening to me? Why is?" Then the story changes. But when you cry unto God, you come out and you say, "Devil, I put on the armor. It's there on me. So I will fight this fight." <clears throat> right? To understand the power of the cross, we must understand identification. Hebrews 2, 10, 11, and verse 14. Jesus identified with us in his birth. So we could identify with him in his death. Jesus was the son of God. He is the son of God. He came into this world. He identified himself by being born as a human being. How many of us were born of a virgin? <clears throat> Any of us were born of a virgin? No? A child is born only after a physical relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. And this virgin birth will never happen again. Why? Because God identified, God chose to come into this world without sin. He identified with us. How long was Jesus in the stomach? Two weeks. How long? Nine months? Okay. No special gift. Two weeks, three weeks. Nine months. Did Jesus have three eyes? One in case he has to see somewhere else. Did he eat normal food? Did he have to eat food? Well, Jesus says, no. I. You know, the disciples came up to, his followers came, show us some miracles, no. When Moses was there, manna came down from heaven. Do some miracles. They came to Jesus and asked that. Do some miracles. What does Jesus say? Hey, I am the manna. I am that manna who came down. I am the bread of life. You, you eat me and drink of my blood. Can you imagine the disciples? What are you talking about? You're talking about cannibalism? You're talking about eating human flesh and human blood is it is against the jewish customs the, it is it's it's a offense to god and jesus is saying you eat my body drink my blood you see when we jesus he identified with us he was a human being just like you and me he walked around just like you and me and so that we could identify with him in his death. We identify in his death. Jesus became like unto us so that he could represent us on the cross. He represents us. In the mind of, mind of God, we were in him on the cross. What happened to Christ on the cross happened to you and me because we were in him. That's why the great apostle Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives within me. So that means what? Apostle Paul was not living for himself. You can't go to, you know, imagine Satan going to Apostle Paul and saying, I'll kill you. What Apostle Paul would have said? Good. And Satan, okay, I'll bring shipwreck and I'll persecution, put you in the jail. Good. So Satan is wondering, how do, I, how do I intimidate this guy? He's not afraid of death. He's not afraid of jail. He's not afraid of persecution. He's not afraid of anything. What can I do to this guy? And if he's in jail also, he's writing letters and sending it to the church. If he's in jail also, he's destroying the whole jail cell. And the jailers are accepting Jesus. Their family is accepting Jesus. What is happening? How do I stop this guy? You know why? Because Apostle Paul did not live for himself. In his mind, if you kill me, good. If you don't kill me, good. It doesn't matter. I'm crucified with Christ. I've already, whatever Jesus says, it's done. If I die today, I will be with the Lord Jesus. What more do I want? And if you keep me here on earth, I'll be doing the ministry. 
and many more lives will come to come to know Jesus. So that's also good. Can't do anything to a person like that. One, the key was the apostle Paul was crucified with Christ. It was not about him. It was not about his life. He didn't love his life. He was willing. He was like willing to let go of his life. Right. The cross gave us the power of over sin and death. On the cross, Jesus Christ broke the power of sin over our lives. He on the cry on the cross, Jesus Christ annulled Satan's power over our life. What is the meaning of annulled? Right. He, sorry, yeah, he nullified. He emptied Satan's power. If Okay, for example, you know, if Jesus is standing, right, and there are some uh, thousand demons or Satan himself, do you think that Satan is going to come with his hands and he say, okay, Jesus, I want to talk to you regarding something. Do you think that's going to happen? You know, the Bible says on the cross, in Genesis 4, he crushed the serpent's head. You know, that's what we do with cockroaches, no? You see a cockroach, what do you do? You don't chase it away. <laughs> okay, maybe some of us are scared of it, but then you crush it. And Jesus, just picture this, have this picture in your mind. There's a serpent going, he stamps on that serpent's head, he crushes it. That means what? He's you know, pressing it down, crushing the head of the serpent. The head is the more main thing, right? You get the head, it's done. Only, only the tail keeps shaking. Because it's in the head where all the, you know, the venom and everything is there. It's defeated. Satan's power was defeated on the cross. We talked about Ephesians, Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Having disarmed every principality, every authority, every power of darkness. He disarmed it. He made a public spectacle of the devil triumphing over them on the cross. So if Jesus is there, the devil dare not come near him. The devil cannot. He cannot stand. You know, that same Satan who said, turn the stone into bread, why don't you jump off, tempted Jesus. Now, Revelations chapter 1 talks about the glorified Jesus. You think Satan can come near the glorified Jesus? Always. All authority, all dominion, all power belongs to him. He's seated on the throne. He's the king of majesty, the ancient of days. The one who holds the stars in his hand. He, the, the galaxies, he expands the earth. He expands the galaxies. And everything is in his hand. And sometimes we pray, God, I have cold. Can you please remove the cold? God is big. He's great. He is in authority. We are delivered from the powers of darkness. Satan has no authority over us except what we permit him to do in our lives. Remember this, when, when Satan was thrown in on the earth, God did not take away his authority or his gifts and skills that he had. God did not take away. So the devil has his own ways of working. Do we see the devil working around us? Plenty of ways. Why? It is because of us. We open the door to the enemy. Right? When we open the door, the enemy comes in. But even sometimes we make these mistakes, we open the door. But when we call unto Jesus, he is faithful to answer us. It's not like Jesus is sitting, you open the door. No, no. How do we close the door? No. Jesus has the power. He has the authority. 
to destroy the power of sin and sickness over your life. He has it. He's done it. He will continue to do it. We hear of testimonies all across of people who have almost been in their deathbed, but they've got up and walked out of the hospital. And the doctors don't know what to do. We've heard of testimonies where people have died. They've got their death certificate, and then they're alive. They're holding their death certificate and taking photo. The doctors have no explanation for it. Why? Because sometimes we open doors, the enemy works, but God is still powerful. God is supreme. He has the authority over Satan and death. How, did you, how do you know it? Is it some stories that I'm saying? Or is it some, something that I understand? No. What about Lazarus? You know what happens when blood does not flow to the brain? You get brain damage. We can't think. You, you'll die. You can't. Blood has to flow into the brain for us to live. Lazarus is in the tomb for how many days? Four days. When Lazarus got up, it was not like he had brain damage. He got up, he recognized everyone. Later on in the scriptures, it says that, you know, Lazarus was with Jesus. It was the same Lazarus who Jesus raised him from the dead. Now, Jesus didn't go into the technical terms. Okay, what about the brain? Uh, now, four days, the blood has not gone into his body. No, no, no. God is a supernatural God. All of these things don't matter to him. Do you understand? It matters to us. Maybe the doctors will say, you know, it matters to the doctors, but it doesn't matter to Jesus at all. If he has decided to do a miracle, it is done. The doctors cannot change it. That's why I always say the doctor's report is not the final report. Yes? Right? So even as believers, we must know this. We must know it to be true, reckon it. And we must walk in this. Now, I'm not saying that no, we will not fail at all. We will not, you know, fall down. We will not go through challenges. We will. I I will going for, forward. There may be challenges that I will feel weak and I may fall, but we got his word. We've got his promises with us. Right? We hold on to that. The blessings that flow through Calvary. The blessings that come to each one of us through the cross. Forgiveness of sins, restoration unto God. That is the greatest, the greatest aspect of being a believer. We have forgiveness of sins. You know, other religions, they, they have a lot of things to do, including Judaism. Right? The people of Israel, what did they do for forgiveness of sins? Guilt offering, sin offering, pain offering, get a goat, cut the goat, cut the lamb, pour the blood, atonement, so many things to do. But now, all we need to do is go to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, these are the sins that I have committed. I ask that you forgive my sins. Cleanse me. Make me whole. You don't even have to have a cross in front of you. You don't have to touch the cross, touch the feet of Jesus' cross, the, on Jesus on the cross. You don't have to do all of that. Forgiveness, justification by faith in Jesus Christ. How do I know my sins are forgiven? You have faith. So you go to Jesus, say, Lord, I did something very wrong. Please forgive me. And I thank you for your word that says, if I confess my sins, you are faithful and you are just to forgive me. So I receive your forgiveness and I thank you for helping me to live a holy life. In Jesus' name, amen. That moment, your sins are forgiven. Now You don't have to go back and say, how do I know? Is there a sign? Lord, can you show me a sign? The fan is on. Make it stop. Then I'll know the, that you have forgiven my sins. You don't have to do all of that. You have forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus paid the price on the cross. I find forgiveness through that. 
So if there are sins in our life right now that we have, nobody knows about it. Don't keep it in. Don't let it become a sin that will keep growing and growing. Just go back to the cross. Now is the time. I don't hold on to it. Don't say, okay, nobody knows it's okay. No. Just go back to the cross. That's why the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword that penetrates into dividing, into our soul, into our spirit, into our joints and marrows. The word of God speaks into our spirit. Right? And so don't let sin lurk around inside your life. There are things that go up. One of the things that we must do as believers is every time you start to pray, say, God, I thank you for the gift of life. I thank you that you are faithful. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Right? Sometimes it could be a thought. Sometimes it could be a word. Right? Sometimes it could be just getting angry. Now, two days back, there were a lot of kids playing near my house. They were making so much noise. I was unable to, you know, prepare. I was preparing some content and got so upset. I came out and I said, hey, are you guys? I shouted at them. I got upset. Then when I went back and I sat, I said, oh, God, they're kids. Fifth standard, sixth standard kids. And it's summer break. They finished their exams. They're playing. I shouldn't have got upset. So I went back to God. I didn't say, okay, now I should uh, leave the ministry because of that. Go back to Jesus and say, Lord, help me. Forgive me. I should not have got upset. But I got upset. And this is not what something that you expect out of me. So I confess my sins. Help me. Fruit of the Spirit is patience. is a fruit of the Spirit. So help me to walk, to be patient. Forgive me for oh, speaking rudely. Help me to walk in humility, walk in love. Then what do you do? You call all the children up and give them juice. Everything is sorted. <laughs> right? So I'm not saying that it has to be a big sin. It could be something else this. But we must confess it. Now, if we don't confess, what will happen? This small things of getting upset can grow, 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 and grow. You know what happens? Eventually, for everything, you get upset. Right? Why is the chair not straight? You get upset. Why is the fan so fast? You get upset. Why is the light dim? So these things can control us. Right? It may be silly things, but they can control us. So it's very important that we uh, go back, ask forgiveness of sins. Two, most powerful, healing from sickness and disease. OK. Do you believe that Jesus can heal every sickness? You believe it? You're sure? Any disease, whatever the disease is, how do you know Jesus will? There's no medicine for it. And there are some uh, diseases like, uh, forget what's the name of this. There's no medicine. There's nothing you can do. In, uh, you know, especially uh, insanity. People who are mad. There's no medicine. But can Jesus heal them? Sure about it. The doctor will say no medicine. Jesus doesn't need medicine. Jesus can heal. The cross heals us from every sickness and disease. Every sickness and disease. I love that verse. I forget the verse. Uh, but... In the book of Exodus, when the people of Israel came out of Egypt and they were walking, none of them were sick in their bodies. Can you picture that? Have you thought of walking in the desert? Have you, you know, you try walking in the desert. One, you'll get leg pain. Leg pain can turn into fever. Fever can turn into high fever. There's no water there. There's no proper food. Have you ever thought of it? No, no sickness. Not one of them was sick. When they were in Egypt, what does God say? I will make sure that none of the diseases that fall upon the Egyptians will fall on you. 
they were there in the same place it's like for example you, this is egypt some are here some are in the first floor the disease is going everywhere but only those in the ground floor are getting sick and all diseases but first floor everyone are enjoying nothing is happening to them because god supernaturally protected the people of israel so remember that sickness and disease is in the control of god's hand god controls it okay so so he's able to bring healing now the question may come up so why didn't god heal so we people right. that may be a genuine question we are not god to answer that right. there are times god has his way god has his plans he has his purposes but that does not change the fact that god is in control over everything that's happening around us right the power of sin is broken three we have wholeness which is shalom wholeness four we have authority and dominion over the enemy what is authority we have the authority we have dominion over the devil over demons and over the work of the enemy over darkness we have the authority right what is well, in first corinthians paul writes and he says the weapons of our warfare not carnal they are mighty in god they bring down strongholds and pretensions they cast down reasonings and arguments that's what they do the weapons of our warfare are not carnal they are mighty in god right so you take the authority you take you use the dominion and the power that god has given you to speak over your life to speak over your family to speak over the things that god wants to do in your life right fifthly the blessings of abraham are included deuteronomy 28 talks about those wonderful wonderful blessings right i will bless you i will keep you right all those blessings the abrahamic covenant that we talked about every blessing i will make you the father i make you the head and not the tail you will be blessed wherever you go your fruit the your fruits will be your palms will be blessed you will be multiplied i will i will bless you in every way you will you will be the father of many nations your children will be blessed so many blessings all those blessings are included in the new testament in the new covenant blessings all of them are included when god made the promise to abraham he said i will bless you he was stating that all who god is and all that god does was being released to abraham god did not need to itemize the list of the blessings but he said i will bless you it's a, if you read that portion there's seven sevenfold blessings i will i will i will seven times i will it is done i will bless you i will make you great I, i will do it that's god's word that's god's blessings upon us and as new covenant a new covenant has uh, uh, has better promises of the old so you and i in the new covenant we can pray we can say god i'm part of this i receive all the blessings of the abrahamic covenant but i've also received all the blessings of the new covenant which is a greater and a better covenant but remember this there are blessing stealers we talked about this right that fight again they try to steal the blessings of god from our life the devil will try to make us feel that we are useless make us feel that we are nothing blessing stealers our own mind can make us feel that we are nothing right so that's why paul writes in romans 12 he says do not be conformed to this world don't listen to what the world says don't be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind renew your mind don't think in the natural think in the spiritual think of what you want to see yourself think of what jesus sees you there was a time in my life you know there was fear there was fear 
And I would always be fearful. But I thank God that God just broke that. Fear is not something that we, are live, we have to live by. What does Jesus say? The just shall live by faith. We live by faith. We don't visit faith whenever we want to or whenever we need it. We live by faith. Right? And so I want to encourage us, right? Don't let these blessing stealers take you away from the call of God and what God wants to do in your life. Look at the cross. Focus on what Jesus wants to do in your life. And you tell God, this is what I want to do. I thank you that you are with me. I thank you that you have taken the price on the cross. I thank you that you have blessed me. And I thank you that you have destroyed the devil. And right now, as your child, I have dominion and power over everything that the enemy is doing. So I will walk in that authority. So you take your place and chase away those blessing stealers out of your life. Right? Okay. We'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll continue with the next chapter.